I'm Dr. Eric Jacobson from Twin Cities Dermatopathology, Pathology, and I have the honor of having with me today Dr. Angelica Salim from Duke University. Uh, Dr. Salim, what are some of the most important issues in vulvar pathology today? There are several, but I think so that the dermatopathologists need to understand that when they receive the biopsy, they may receive it from different specialties. Then whenever they put together the case and the report, you need to have a communication, a vocabulary that will be clear for people trained in specialties as wide as gynecology, urology, and even primary practice. Then the vocabulary need to be clear. Then they need to understand that sometimes one biopsy is not enough for a final diagnosis, then several biopsies need to be uh, obtained and the clinician need to be also learning that. And to take the most of each biopsy, we need a clinical record of a picture. And I always tell my clinician, take a picture, mark where is the biopsy, in order that if the first biopsy was not diagnostic, be able to go back, but not take the same location, take another part of the disease in order to reach the diagnosis. Therefore, the issues here for dermatopathology is a good report, clear vocabulary, and have a photographs in order to see the evolution of the disease and to have a medical record about where the biopsies are taken. Do you find that there are barriers to getting clinical photographs, especially in areas like the vulva, but just in general as well? I believe they are. The patients are more open mind, but uh, a vulva uh, area still be uh, with a lot of prejudices from the patient, and they bring some barriers that the physician need to learn how to sort of make understand the patient that this is for their benefits, and that is going to be part of the record. That any part of the record will have some type of photograph, and that they need to be. Learning that is to improve and increase the uh, uh, diagnosis and it's going to be extremely positive for the patient. Um, do you think that there are differences between the way that gynecological pathologists and dermatopathologists view current issues in, and describe things in vulvar pathology? We are getting closer and closer. I think so that how we did see sometimes was a little bit different, but because we have societies that are the perfect forum for gynecopathologists and dermatopathologists to get together, discuss, create terminology, create classifications, that had been decreasing the distance about how we see vulvar pathology. And at the same time, we are teaching each other. Basically, we have, even in the society, uh, people from the uh, gynecopathology field coming to talk to us. And dermatopathology members of the society go to their societies to express their how we classify dermatopathology, the inflammatory disorders, etc. Therefore, I think so that the bridge, the, that space is being reduced to nothing right now. So have you been involved with some of those efforts? Oh, absolutely. I have been invited to the USCAP for the uh, mm -hmm. gynecopathology. Just I was uh, invited uh, to a meeting in Germany about a group of gynecopathologists uh, looking for um, presenting how I classify inflammatory disorders. And although I'm always surprised because they are not people that hear this topic every day, the enthusiasm, the, the, the questions shows that they really want to learn about how dermatopathology they classify inflammatory disorders. I talk about pigmented lesions, how we work out the diagnosis of pigmented lesions. Basically, I think so that we are putting out there our way of seeing the inflammatories and pigmented lesions, and they are really very avid to obtain that information to be able to communicate with us. That's great. Do, do you approach both inflammatory and melanocytic things differently on the vulva as opposed to other mm -hmm. parts of the body? I see so that we have been learning that there are little things that we need to adapt how we yeah. classify because if you look at this organ, it's an organ that is covered, have irritation, friction, body fluid, basically has a lot of secondary events that happen that may modify how we see it. But at the same time, after you learn how to keep that in mind, uh, not only that, but also where is the lesion? We have different epitheliums that can may sort of affect how we see it, not the same in the mucosa or modified mucosa or hair-bearing skin. 
if you are always keeping that in your background, basically the, how you approach it is very similar. Okay. Um, and how today is vulvar pathology different than it was when you started practice? Uh, uh, quite different. I oh. see so that we, we were not talking about this. Yeah. No one was teaching us anything. We were not exchanging information. It was a topic that if you look at the books where we train, there was no information about this. Pull out any liver, any classic liver in dermatopathology, there were no information. Now, the more recent editions, they have some information about vulvar pathology. But basically, this has been evolving as a field where everyone was teaching each other, and we saw the need to bring this to the dermatopathology and the gynecopathology and start this conversation. So why weren't we talking about it before? Do you know, have a sense of why? Can I ask you why we were not talking so much about alopecia, why we were not talking so much about other topics, nail? Yeah. And I think so that is only how we evolved, you yeah. know? Uh, people sort of, it's, it's like you are building by blocks, and then you sort of get the blocks of the beginning of the inflammatory disorders, then you learn about, an example, psoriasis. But then you say, oh, how psoriasis appears in the genitalia? Yeah. And it's a little bit different. Then you start to realize that that needs to be explored. Then my sense of that is our evolution. It's our way to sort of go through learning what is the next step in our specialty. And it's great because we always find something to explore, to research, to learn. And that is what keeps us, everyone, coming back to all these meetings and learning from each other. That's for sure. So keeping on with the, the thought of the evolution of, of the field, uh, what do you think, what, would, what do you hope we know in 10 years that we don't currently know? I think so that there is one topic that maybe we are not so aware because, or we are aware indirectly, and that is vulvodynia, okay. the pain yeah. in the woman, in the vulva. And I think so that what happened, how we get related to that is because we have that biopsy that we don't see anything basically, but they are asking us question mark vulvodynia. And then I think so that there is an explosion in research trying to figure out what is behind this pain in this uh, woman and how we can be able, if the biopsy really will have some modifications that can be reliable to diagnose and be something that we can identify to help this woman. I think so that the field of vulvodynia is exploding right now and I think so that I hope they can find because it's so frustrating to have that biopsy from a very symptomatic woman that for us look normal. Mm -hmm. And we show it around and we're trying to learn, but we are them that it feels that, well, it was one biopsy we couldn't help, you know? But I think so that in the future, if we start to understand, maybe it was already there, but we didn't see it, you know? And I hope someone can find that to help me as a pathology to be able to help these women. And the other field, I think so that pigmented lesions, we start to see very recent articles about that the atypical genital nevus are completely different from the melanomas. That field, I'm pretty sure, is the beginning. We need to explore more uh, about that. There is one entity that is the entity of differentiated vein. Very mm -hmm. difficult to diagnose. Everyone gets very scared about that diagnosis. And I see so that after we focus about HPV dysplasia, differentiated vein was sort of coming up and say, well, look at me, I also need to be the focus of attention. And I see so that we start to develop more criteria, how we can reproduce the diagnosis, because it's a diagnosis that if we miss, has a short lifespan and turns when very quickly, supposedly for what we understand now, then we need to identify that. Yeah. Do you think that dermatopathologists uh, are adequately prepared right now to diagnose differentiated men? I think so. We, again, we are uh, we are close, and we are hope that we are closer and closer. I think so that the only way to sort of put yourself in a level to feel confident is have this conversation. Yeah. Have people come in and put their experience because at this point it's pathology to pathology experience. Yeah. They're spreading out. Then I think so that. The more we have pathologists coming and talking, and this is what one I was um, talking in, uh, in a meeting, and I say about differentiated thing, and I say how you diagnose because basically I trained myself. I was looking at all the squamous cell carcinoma, looking at coming, coming, and say, oh, this is that stage. 
and say, oh, we would love that you come back and talk to us about how you train your, yourself and how you start to pull out the cases to the research and work on these cases. That is how we are going to be good at it. It's only learning from each other and experience. So it sounds like my, my take homes are we have to work with our clinicians, <laughs> which is good. Absolutely. And um, we still have a lot, a long way to go too. Yes, and that is the exciting part. That's great. That's great. Any last thoughts for? Uh, no, I think so that you summarized perfectly. I, and I mentioned the more we talk, the more we learn, the more that we spread out the concept, the more that we can help these patients. And they are patients that they need help because they have gone from clinic to clinic without diagnosis, very frustrating in that health uh, area that they cannot have an answer. And like I say, sometimes a name is the first step to the cure because the patient feel that has been uh, giving them a category where she has that disease. And no, I don't know what you have them. I see so that that is the first step to the cure for that patient. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much oh, for joining me. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.